Okay. Hello, everyone. We are here united, reunited to make engines great again. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. So, okay, I will give a brief presentation of what's coming up in the new Godot version, uh, Godot 3. Uh, this version has been in development for a long time. Uh, so uh, usually we make releases every like six months or something, sometimes a bit sooner, sometimes, sometimes a bit later, but this time uh, it's taking a long time. So this presentation is a bit to explain why and why everything has changed. So uh, can you see all, all the, well, it doesn't matter. So well, basically, uh, we took the chance to uh, break a lot of compatibility. What happened is that over the years, uh, we found bugs or things that could be improved or, or things that couldn't be solved without like uh, breaking something in the engine that would break compatibility. Like we, to make something better, we need to change it and make it more different. So we didn't do it uh, for a long time to avoid games that were already being made from breaking. But uh, the list of things that needs to be broken was accumulating over the years. So after like three or four, four years of, of development, finally the, the, the time has come because uh, Godot 3 is getting a new rendering engine uh, which breaks compatibility with the previous rendering engine and there's no way to make them compatible because they use different ways of working. So we take that chance and break a lot of things. There is a list of like a hundred things that were broken, which is really, really long. Uh, and we took the chance to, to break everything. So as we optimized a lot, a lot of the internals of the engine, uh, a lot of the APA that was like uh, strange was changed. Uh, and just a lot of little things that accumulated and were a lot. So. I think this will result in Godot 3 being a, a much nicer experience of things just working even more. Uh, so I hope it will be worth it. So also uh, the, the new version is going to support a new 3D engine, uh, as I said before, uh, which is really modern. Uh, the techniques it uses are super, super like high end. Uh, in, in just, we, we just came up with, with many of them uh, and are not using other engines. I will talk about that uh, later. Uh, we will also be adding visual scripting support so we can uh, edit your code visually. Uh, I know a lot of people is like, ah, I hate visual scripting, why coding is better, which is of course right. But there are, other, there are many other uses for it which are very important, so we'll also talk about that later. Uh, we will be getting a new uh, way of interacting with the C++, uh, thanks to Sir over there, Thomas, uh, because uh, it usually is a problem that people want to add some code in C++ for performance or just for binding to an external library, like, I don't know, SQLite or something like that. Uh, and it's a hassle because you have to recompile the engine. You cannot re redistribute what, what you do. Uh, we have an asset library where you can download things for the engine, but uh, if you recompile the engine, it no longer works. Uh, it gets incompatible. So all this uh, system, uh, the GD native, will uh, allow uh, for integrating all kinds of things into Godot without recompiling. Uh, just download from the asset library and it's going to work, uh, which is pretty cool. We're also working on C-sharp support because a lot of users that come from Unity and, and previously also X and A really like C-sharp and don't want to change language. So we are going to add C-sharp support for, for them. Uh, thanks to Mono being purchased by Microsoft, Microsoft changed the license of Mono, and the license is now MIT, so we can integrate it into Godot finally. Uh, actually, Microsoft is uh, looking into funding this effort, so we will probably have a, a very nice and high quality support for, for the platform. Uh, we are also getting a new network multiplayer API. Uh, I started working with it, but then the man over there has continued the work and is improving it. Uh, we should make uh, making multiplayer games really easy. Uh, the approach is pretty cool. You just change a, a bit of things in the source code and you can make your games multiplayer without changing that much of how you work and make games in Godot. Uh, what else? Uh, I will have a new audio engine. Uh, the new audio engine is really cool. You have like a kind of like a digital audio workstation with buses, you can route audio and put effects and things like that. And finally, thanks to the Mozilla guys who are also lending us this place, 
Uh, we will have WebAssembly and WebGL2 support, so Godot will work really nicely on the web. You will be able to export your game uh, and very, like, without any loading times or anything, will just work on, on the web browser, and that will be fantastic. I think in the future we can also make the uh, Godot engine interface also work on the on the browser. So for people that has Chromebooks or platforms which are which are like less uh, less as, as less easy to work with. So well, uh, I will talk a bit about the new 3D engine. This is called phys physically based rendering. It's a new technique that was invented by the Disney guys. Uh, you know that uh, Disney at some point tried to purchase Pixar, which made movies. Uh, and at the time, Pixar was like, ah, we're very expensive. So Disney started making movies on their own and they created their own 3D animation studio. And they have really smart people in there. And they came up with this technique, which, which basically what it does is uh, simplifies how the materials are created for making uh, 3D uh, objects. Like you have something called the metalness, which is how much it reflects light. Uh, you have the roughness, which is like how uh, mirror-like the reflection is, like this is a mirror and has perfect reflection, this is not and has a diffuse reflection. And with a small amount of parameters, you can make a large amount of, of materials, which is really nice. Uh, so we are supporting this and the new uh, Godot version. We deprecate the old uh, uh, diffuse and specular system, which is kind of obsolete right now, everywhere. Uh, Godot uses a very interesting system. Uh, Right now, engines are going the deferred rendering path, which means that they first render all the objects and materials to the screen, and they, they render all the lights separately, which is a technique that allows rendering a lot of lights, uh, which is really nice. Uh, but it has a limitation that you cannot have many material parameters because you need a lot of memory to store. You have to, per every pixel, store the material parameters, which is not very efficient. So there's this, this new technique called cluster rendering, which was used in games like uh, the new Doom game, uh, which is really cool because you can use a lot of lights and you don't need a deferred rendering approach. Uh, so if we can save for that, uh, we can have more complex materials. So the new version of Godot has a lot of options for materials that other engines do not have because of this approach, which is really new, uh, which is nice. Uh, also, also thanks to this uh, approach, we can use uh, multi-sample anti-aliasing, uh, which most engines cannot use because they use a deferred approach. So you just turn up the anti-aliasing, it looks super beautiful without any kind of hacks or anything like that, or without using temporal anti-aliasing, which is, which is another technique which is, which is more expensive. So well, and we have a new uh, pipeline for post-processing. Uh, the nice thing about this is that engines like uh, Unity or other engines are more modular, so you have to like try to put like every post process has to allocate its own memory and has to copy everything to do the post process. What we did in Godot 3 is uh, we made the post processing hard coded at the end of the of the development. It's not modular; it's totally hard coded. The benefit of that is that it's really really fast. Uh, you can use a lot of pro post processes in Godot, and it runs on a really low end GPU. Uh, in other engines, you need a really high-end GPU to put all the post-processes. Uh, I was developing first on a AMD A8 or something like that, which is a really low-end CPU with low-end GPU, and it was working perfectly. Like you could use all the post-processes really nicely. So it's nice that they are all integrated, they use low memory, and they are really fast. So the thing is that out of the box, uh, Godot lets you make something that is very high quality, and it runs on very low-end hardware unlike probably at our engines, which is one of the interesting things. So this is a bit of, uh, a bit of how it works. Uh, the the post-processing effects in Godot are very innovative in the way they work. Uh, they are unlike others you probably have seen. One is the Glow processor. Uh, I, I sadly don't have my computer here, so I can't show exactly how it works. But basically, when you, uh, the, the way of doing the bloom effect in games, usually what you take is the image and you do a blur, like you make it blur, and you put it over the existing image, kind of like in Photoshop, you add a new layer and you add like a kind of a, the screen mode or something like that. Uh, the interesting thing is in God that you have a multiple resolution blurring and you can toggle every, uh, every one of them. So for example, you can do a bloom or a glow in the objects that uh, is like an outline, 
or you can make it in like in this image that you can see here that is very dreamlike, that is very extended. So you have a lot of control about how you, you make the bloom, which is really interesting. Oranges that just give you maybe four steps of, of, of blurring. Now this, this, I think this one gives you eight and you have individual control over them. So you can get to do really nice effects with it. So we have also a screen space ambient occlusion. Uh, this is a very popular technique because it works when you, when a, like, when you have indirect light, like light usually you have, the, the sun is shining in something, but the light will bounce around. Uh, the places that are, are not directly affected use what is called ambient light. So the problem with that is that uh, to make, to understand the, 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 the form of things, you need some kind of occlusion uh, that, that acts, adds a kind of darkness around them. So this is, this is kind of a hacky technique, but it's used a lot because it, it lets you like see the, out, the, the shapes of the objects much better when light is not affecting them directly. So the implementation in God is kind of standard. It's, uh, it's very fast, but it's mostly standard. Uh, we also have screen, screen space reflections. Uh, this is a pretty popular technique nowadays in game engines. I don't like it so much myself. Uh, I think it's kind of really hacky. Uh, what it does is create a reflection using the same information you have on the screen. So you can only reflect what is on the screen uh, in other parts of the screen. Like you, you, as you see in this image, the wall is, is reflecting the wall above. Uh, and it, it's, it's kind of hacky, it works, people kind of likes it. But we have a better system for Godot 3. Uh, this is the standard in most engines, but in Godot 3 we have a different way of doing these kind of reflections. So that will be interesting. Uh, we also have depth of field blur, uh, which is also very common in game engines. You can uh, blur what is uh, behind a certain distance and what is uh, before a certain, certain distance. Um, again, the implementation in Godot is really efficient. Uh, try to write it in a way that uh, we uh, don't need so much passes and buffers and things. It's very simple and very efficient. It's really, the, the near the fulfilling Godot is super hacked in, in a way that is not physically correct, but it looks pretty good, so I, I hope people like it. Uh, otherwise, it will, I will have to rewrite it. Uh, and this is one of the key points in Godot 3. We have real-time global illumination, uh, which is, uh, as you see, the only solution for any kind of real-time global illumination is proprietary. It's called uh, Enlighten, and it's developed by a AMD. It was AMD? No, ARM. It it's developed by ARM, uh, the one, the guys that make the processors for mobile. And um, so every engine, like Unreal, you need to use this proprietary solution, which is closed. Uh, there's no open source solution. So one of the goals for Godot 3 was just trying to find a way to have global illumination uh, in a way that, that works in an open source engine, that was quite a challenge. Uh, and came up with a solution that is pretty nice. Uh, it's very, very, very high quality. Uh, it works for, mostly for indoors, uh, which are medium size or uh, small sized. Uh, there's still not any global illumination solution for like very large terrains. Uh, so I think we may find something eventually in, in God in, for maybe version 3.1. But in, in any case, uh, <clears throat> the idea of global emission is that the direct light uh, will just hit something and the light will bounce uh, in objects. So even if something is not directly lit by light, it still gets a contrib like contribution. Um, the implementation in God 3 is pretty cool because uh, it's not totally fully dynamic. Uh, the objects that will contribute to lighting need to be static. But everything else, like the lights, uh, you can move them around and they will change the contribution. Uh, you can add and remove lights and change parameters and it's all dynamic. Uh, you can also move objects and they will be affected by the light contribution in real time. So if you have a, a, a scene and you have a, a character moving around, he will be affected by the indirect light also, which is really nice. Uh, you can use emission light, you know, materials that emit light, uh, and this will also add to the light contribution. Uh, so this is an example of how it looks, uh, the global illumination. This is the typical kernel box. Uh, it's pretty faithful to, uh, to the original kernel box, if you look at it. Uh, you can see that, for example, do you have the mouse pointer? Ah, yeah, yes. You can see that there, this wall is red, and this side of the, of the box is getting uh, bo light bounced in red color. And the same with this one is getting light bounced with green color. 
this is all the indirect lighting. And this is emission. This, this material has emission and is actually lighting everything else. So it's, it's pretty nice. Uh, you can see the real time here, like this first image. Uh, the light is, is, is kind of like a, a sunset. So the light is uh, here, just only getting lit, and everything else is lit by indirect lighting. So you can see different times of the day how uh, it will light the, the, the scene. And here, like, it's uh, noon, so you can see the light is just uh, affecting the floor because it's, the sun is above. And it's, uh, you can see, for example, that everything around the floor is getting lit thanks to the indirect illumination. So that, that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, this is an example of uh, materials with emission. If you make a material which, has, uh, which uh, emits light, uh, the new global illumination system will use it for both uh, light emission and also reflections. So you can see that, for example, here, this is reflecting this column here. So it looks really good. Actually, in my opinion, it looks better than uh, proprietary solutions that are using existing proprietary, proprietary game engines. Uh, so I hope people will, will like this kind of uh, advance in, in rendering. Uh, well, this. I will switch to visual scripting. Uh, again, it's not intended to replace programming. A lot of people think, hey, they're going to like, replace me by a, by a, by a graph, and it's, it's not true. Uh, the idea of visual scripting is when you work in a team to have uh, designers and 3D artists be able to do some stuff from themselves, because usually programmer, the programmer is usually the most expensive resource in the company. Uh, and uh, you want uh, to, the programmers to focus on important things and not in just making tiny things. So visual scripting is mostly to take away work from you, the programmer, uh, not really to replace you or anything like that. Uh, so you don't have to do like simple things and others can do it. Visual scripting is also nice for people that wants to learn the engine and does not understand about programming. So you can, uh, use Godot without being a programmer with it, uh, and then uh, learn programming and use it like better. So that, that's kind of the idea. It has been requested a lot, that's why we, we added it. So, so it's just there. Uh, one of the nice things is that is very, this, this approach is very similar to the Unreal Blueprint uh, system. It's not exactly the same, it looks similar, but it has many differences. Uh, it uses, like as you can see, in white, these are sequence connections, which means this happens first, then this happens, and then this happens. And these are data connections, which means when this step is executed, where does it get the data from? Uh, so it's kind of very easy to follow and to read. Uh, you can add default, when there's no connection, you can put a default value to the, to the port, which is also very visual. Uh, and one nice thing about this is that it's very readable. Uh, visual scripts are very readable. If you look at this function, for example, uh, on the visual script, it's very easy to see what it's doing. Uh, while on the code, it may be not that easy for someone that does not understand programming. So you can give this to someone uh, as a visual script, and they, like your game designer can change it and do changes to it without breaking things because it will always kind of work. In, in, in the code, you forget like a brace or something and it crashes. If you give this to a, a designer to make modifications, uh, he or she will be able to, to do it without uh, really compromising the stability of the game. It will usually just work because it's very, it's very difficult to, to screw up with it. So this is an interesting comparison that was done uh, a few months ago. Uh, you probably, most of you have done the Pong demo on the step-by-step -step tutorials, which is a very basic Pong. Uh, it's not very many lines of code. So you can see it like here on the right is the original code for the Pong tutorial. Here on the left, uh, I tried to replicate it one-to-one -one using Visual Script. And you can see it's a mess. It's really complicated. Uh, this, of course, speaks well of programming. Uh, then, uh, the next step was trying to use something called expression node. So you can, like, if you have a complex formula, you can put it inside an, in a Visual Script node. And as you can see, this has simplified this a lot. 
And this is just a visual script, but trying to use all the Godot features, like detecting collisions and uh, when something moves, uh, all the signals, uh, using mostly signals for callbacks. And you can see that it becomes really simple. You can make a punk with only this amount of visual script code, which is not very much. Uh, it's, it's less nodes than lines of code, which is nice, I think. Uh, so if you use uh, Visual Script properly, you can do a lot of things with it without really taking a lot more time than programming. So as I said before, if you're working with a designer or an artist, it's nice that you can do some of your code with Visual Script where the, in places that they can do modifications to it for whatever reason they need to do modifications. It's a very nice way of doing teamwork. So well, multiplayer. Uh, I don't have much to say about it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Fabio will talk more about it later. So uh, it's a very simple API. Uh, it's based on remote processor code. You just, the idea is that you have the same scene loaded in both computers and then communicate between the same nodes in the same scene. Uh, the model, you can use any kind of networking model. Uh, you can use more like what is called authoritative, which means one node, one uh, one server has all the control of everything going on, and we'll try to make sure that clients don't cheat and do anything weird. Uh, or you can just distribute everything with, uh, without uh, between clients and let them do whatever and don't care about security, which is like very common when you have like local multiplayer and things like that. Uh, and um, because you see that the guy next to you is not going to hack you because he's like uh, just next to you playing with you. So. Uh, well, we will see more about this later. Uh, and finally, uh, this is the new audio server, the new audio system in Godot. Uh, the, the audio server is completely rebooted. Every audio, all the audio code was totally trashed, uh, sent to the trash bin, and it's completely new. Uh, we did many changes that people requested. One is that you can use Vorbis for sound effects. Uh, before, you had to use like WAV files, the Microsoft uh, WAV waveforms. Uh, now you can use Boris files because of the way we we are making the new new server. Um, you can use them for music or sound effects. It's the same. Uh, it's bus based, like uh, digital audio workstations. Like if you have seen the Ardour or uh, I don't know Sonar or Cakewalk, they are all uh, bus based. Uh, we have many DSP effects uh, which you can put in like reverb and chorus and things like that. The new audio engine is 5.1 and 7.1 compatible. I don't have any of that, so if anyone wants to test it, and if any of you has any of that setups, please let me know, and we can test. Uh, and one of the nice things is that due to the way the remote debugger works in Godot, you can just play your game in your tablet or phone and adjust the mixing on the, on the computer, and you can just see how it sounds better for it. So that, that's pretty cool. Uh, you have buses, as, you, as I showed you, just have the bus and you have the where the exit of the bus, where, where, where does it go? Like this one is sending to master and the master is sending to the output and things like that. Uh, we have effects, uh, audio, a lot of audio effects. Uh, I am I, thankful that many, many years ago I worked as an audio developer. So I, work, I wrote all the audio effects myself because uh, I couldn't find anything as open source uh, that has a compatible license with Godot. Uh, all the open source audio guys, like the Linux audio developers, like to use GPL, uh, Stripe GPL, so that's a license we can't use in a game engine because you would need to redistribute all the source code of your game with, the, with, with that. So we'll uh, have to rewrite most of the, the, all, all these effects. Like, I mean, I made them myself. I, I'm not sure how good they are, but if anyone knows how to improve them, like, it's welcome. Uh, so well. That's it for now. Uh, I will see you soon in Godot 3.0, uh, anytime that happens, hopefully by July or something like that. So we don't spend more than a year with a version that would suck. Uh, so well, anything you can mail me or just ask me anything you, you want, I guess. So well, I, I guess we can go questions or something like that. If any of you has a question, feel, feel free to receive the cube of wisdom uh, here. Oh. Uh, it, yeah, it's on. Uh, I have a question about the uh, new audio system, which looks really good. Thank you for developing all the effects by yourself. It's huge. Yeah. Um, on the previous version, on the previous version, uh, you have the possibility to play the mod file, you know, the tracker file. 
What? The tracker, the like uh, mod, something that you had on Amiga before. You know, it's ah, yeah, kind of a yeah, MIDI yeah, file, yeah, yeah. but not exactly. Yeah, I Will know. you keep this feature, or we, uh, is it? For now, fresh? I've removed it, but it could be added back. It's not a problem. The problem is that it uses a mixer structure that is that does not longer exist in the new version of Godot. So it's probably just a matter of. Uh, Porting an existing library like uh, Dump or anything like that, so we can have module music again. Uh, if anyone takes the work, it should be really simple. Uh, okay. There's no restrictions for for doing that, I guess. Thanks. Um, for the new visual scripting system, do the nodes are uh, the the visual? The script is uh, compiled into C++ or it's uh, interpret Interpreted. Uh, it's interpreted, uh, but it's typed. So we were talking with Thomas uh, before that maybe we can just uh, optionally uh, compile them to C++. That shouldn't be too too difficult to do. Uh, but first version will probably be just interpreted. Uh, but it's something that can be done without much work eventually. Yeah. Anyone else has a question or? Hello. Um, about the 3D rendering, uh, did you, um, on the actual version, uh, 2.3, I think, um, there is a, a problem with styling. Uh, when we are in 3D, we also we see, uh, uh, actually, the problem, I think, comes from the uh, anti-aliasing. Maybe. A problem with what? Uh, from <laughs> I don't know how to explain. Uh, in, in 3D. Uh, when you use tiles and you want to make very sm uh, small tiles, for example, if you want to make a RTS or something like that. Tiles? Tiles. Uh, the tiles the like grid map? Square tiles. Uh, okay. Like grid map, for example. Okay. Uh, like a grid map, or if you want to do it by hand. Ah, yeah, yeah, same. okay. Uh, the actual rendering engine is um, kind of, I don't know, it makes like some, um, uh, how to say that? You have uh, some dark lines or some lines that are not rendered uh, between tiles because, like, the anti-aliasing or, or uh, yeah. So did, did the new version fix that problem, or is it still something that will happen eventually? On 3D, you shouldn't have much of a problem. I think there's a, a there's an option in the grid map to scale just a bit all the tiles so they uh, don't overlap so much or some or oh, that. Don't get it. Yeah, you, you have like a, you still have the Z fighting problem if you do that too much and if you do it not enough, you'll still have the, the problem of. Uh, I don't really remember. I, I have no idea. Uh, the new, the only changes I think is that the grid map uses, uh, well, you mean for 3D or 2D? Uh, 3D. 3D, I don't remember. I honestly have no idea what the problem is. But uh, we should probably see it uh, working. If you have the computer, you can show me, probably. I'm not sure. Uh, I can show you uh, an example of what it does, uh, actually. But I don't know. With the 3.1, I never tried. So. OK. I, I, I can't think exactly what. In 2D, it's very common because people usually make styles and then enable the filters. So then one tile bleeds into the other. Uh, no, it's uh, not the shaders, it's not the textures or the mid mapping, it's not, nothing to do. Uh, I have no idea, but it, it's, uh, if, we, if you report it, we can fix it, I guess. It's not okay. a problem. Should be something too complicated. The, the only change in grid map is that it uses instancing now, so you should be able to make something like really, really big and it should be more efficient for drawing. That's the only change uh, I know for the new one. Okay. So, uh, thanks. Okay. Anyone else or are we close? Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone.